the whole theme of this conference, of course, is, is going critical. So it's critical discourse. And we'll talk broadly in this panel discussion about what critical discourse is and why you're involved with it and, and why is critical discourse important, broadly speaking. And then I'll try to rein it in and, and focus it on how that's applicable for New Brunswickers and New Brunswick artists and, and how we can better engage with critical discourse here in this province. So I'd like to ask the panelists just, just some, some, to give some background about, about why you're doing this thing that you're doing. Just perhaps tell the audience a little bit about yourself and how, how you came to be employed doing critical, critical writing, critical thinking, critical research. How, how did you come to this, this profession? So perhaps uh, Emma, I can start with you. Um, so uh, my, I guess my background and way into critical discourse in dance was from uh, what I perceived as a lack of critical discourse in dance. And I studied, uh, I'm from Winnipeg, and I studied uh, contemporary dance. And after I was done my degree, I realized I didn't really know anything about uh, the tradition that I studied and why I studied even in, um, it's called Limon Technique um, in modern dance. And I, I had no idea who Jose Limon was, but I had studied his movement for, you know, 10 years or so. And so it led me to pursue a uh, master's in dance at York University and then pursue, um, at the time, uh, there was no PhD studies program in dance in Canada, so I went into an interdisciplinary communications program, and that was kind of my way into uh, discourse in dance. Um, but it was, it was really from identifying a lack of discourse, and I, speci I will stress that, especially in dance, that's, a, I think, a big a big uh, gap in dance education. Uh, well, I work as a, I, I guess I, I'm, I'm unlike quite a few people in here, I'm, I'm essentially an arts administrator, uh, glorified, and in, in, in that sort of encompasses a lot of different things. Uh, I would say when people ask me kind of what I do, I'm, I'm an artist manager. That's the, that's the title in terms of in the music industry. Uh, that involves pretty much every element of Sort of mostly the commercial side of the of, of the business of making the widgets and figuring out where what, what to do with the widgets, um, but in you know, so I'm pretty familiar with the processes and the systems. Uh, I th I found that really interesting that you were talking about system because really it is we're involved in in in, in these systems and you kind of have to figure out how it works and how to play the system, and I, that does I don't mean that in a, in, in a bad way. Uh, just how, how how the system works and how how you fit within uh, whatever environment you're in. Uh, but one of my uh, titles, which I've given myself, um, the police didn't give me this one, I call myself a, a, a professional balloon popper, in that often when I get together with artists, I spend most of my time, you know, they float up the aspirational balloon, and I pop it. <laughs> and, 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 try to, and try to talk about the realities of the situations and not so much the uh, Hollywoodization of the, you know, being discovered at the lunch counter sort of sort of scenario, and just sort of the actual nuts and bolts and involved in the work of being an artist. Oh yes. No, <laughs> oh. it it might be interesting for you how I began and how I entered the critics circle. When I entered the University of Ljubljana. And uh, studying art history back in 1971, I had a few colleagues and friends who were maybe two or three years older than I am, and they were already involved uh, in with students' media, because we had the students' newspaper and the students' radio station, who was one of the most popular because they had really up-to-date music, especially rock music in that time, so. And when these colleagues uh, learned that I s began to study uh, art history, they asked me, oh, why don't you write for us? So the academic year starts October the 1st, at least at our university. In November, I already had my first article, uh, uh, an exhibition review, published. 
And so it was uh, read on the students' radio. And step by step, first the young uh, artists or the students of the Fine Arts Academy came to me and asking me to write uh, forwards for their catalogs. And so after, maybe I was in my third year of study, even the, um, art, the artists with quite a big reputation have heard my articles at their students' radio station and came to me asking me to write for them as well. And it goes on since 1971. <laughs> It's so it's so interesting because I've been thinking a lot about how how do I bring some common threads here. I mean, this is a very multidisciplinary panel, but I think just from the introduction, you can see it, you're you're. It's it's not like there's a job description, art critic or music critic, and you, you've you've forged your own way very much in your in your research and your PhD program, and 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 and, and you know moving taking the opportunities as they as they come. So, uh, common thread established. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Peter, I'd like to come back to to a comment you made about uh, the the professional balloon popping. Is that what you said, balloon popping? Yeah. Yes. Or, or you know, bringing down the as no, not bring down the aspirations. We don't do that. We anyway, you're you're very you're very positive whenever I've dealt with you. Um, but I'd like to ask you and the rest of the panel. I'm sorry, I'm standing behind you. I'd like to ask you and the rest of the panel about. The, the the benefits, but then also the, the consequences of critical discourse, and how how do you balance out? Like it's it's necessary, right? I mean, we I think we all we all agree that that this is something that's vital to an art an artist and an art career. We we need it, but you in the position of the critic, how aware are you of the the potential harm that can be caused versus the potential for advancing a career. So Peter, maybe I'll start with you since you mentioned the balloon popping. Um, I, I, I guess I, I try pretty hard to be empathetic and empathetic with the people that, that I'm dealing with and each situation is really unique. I mean some people I go in and I will be going in to do a consultation on their business and I will talk to them where it's really much easier to be sort of very sort of like you know, right, wrong sort, sort of thing. And, uh, but then as a manager, uh, I'm involved in not the, the creative part, but I am uh, I'm responding to kind of an emotional appeal. I mean, there's the, you do things because you, I do some things because it's a job, you know, and it's sort of like, here's the work, here's the widgets, here's the process. And then as a manager, I get involved in things that, uh, that, that, uh, that I respond to emotionally and I believe have the ability to resonate with, with, with other people. So uh, it really is a, it's a sort of an individual and unique process. I, I had kind of an interesting experience a while back. There's a young artist in St. John who I have a great deal of respect for and I think is really talented. And we got into a discussion. There was a show that was going on that I wanted them to participate in and they weren't so keen to participate in it. And I was sort of kind of like, well, why wouldn't you want to do it? And back and forth a little bit, and it came back to me that, that this person, if they weren't having fun, they had no desire to be part of the process. And there was a bit of an eye-opener for me, and it was really, it was sort of a, because I came at it from a fairly critical sort of position, and I wasn't thinking of that. And, and so trying to have to be pretty conscious of why the person you're working with, and I think this translates into, in, into any, any medium, why are they doing this? You know, are, are they doing this because they think this is a career or are they doing it because it's something that is important to them emotionally? So certainly trying to be pretty, really empathetic of the people that I'm talking to and trying to understand where they want to go and then sort of tailoring my responses to, to where I perceive I think they kind of want to go. If, you know, if they just want to do it for the, for the beauty of the experience, then I really can't be too critical, but if somebody really wants to think about being a career artist, or, or then then I can sort of bring a different perspective to it and perhaps be a little bit more uh, a little bit more critical. Yeah. Well, in general, I can say that with art critics, it's, the story is more or less the same as with artists. We have great artists. We have mediocre artists. We have bad artists or non-artists. So we have 
excellent critics, we have average or mediocre critics, and we have bad critics. Well, uh, one of the difficulties of our profession is that you always expose yourself and uh, uh, you are practically expected to write good reviews. Because if you write bad review, if you say that exhibition is bad for this, this, and this, with arguments, not just because you feel so, you risk to be considered or artist's personal enemy or total idiot who does not know anything about the art. So there are very few critics who can afford to be critical one of them uh, was the British critic uh, writing for Evening Standard, Brian Sewell. Nearly all of his uh, writings, his reviews, were very critical, not to say negative. But anyway, he survived. And uh, he, he had such a strong position and uh, his arguments when he qualified uh, some uh, art event as bad or n not good enough were so strong that uh, he had practically no uh, uh, opposition. I was attacked several times by minor artists, but I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> and what Ever uh, I did, uh, I also sometimes attacked uh, important artists, at, at least they were considered kind of national heroes. And there was an artist in Slovenia, he died uh, four years ago, who was, uh, let's say, the, the god of the socialist self-management system. He was uh, awarded all the possible prizes. He had about 15 monographs written on him, exhibitions in museums and everything. He, he lived in a villa with a swimming pool, driving the last model of Mercedes. So when in 1991, Slovenia became independent and the church, the Catholic church became more and more important, this guy started to draw and paint crucifixions and other uh, uh, motives from uh, Christian or Catholic uh, iconography. So he, he really wanted, he was not satisfied what he has achieved and the, uh, all the wealth he achieved, all the honors. No, no, he wanted now with the new regime to be celebrated. And his last exhibition that he made at the Museum um, of Modern Art, I wrote a very negative review because it was really a bad exhibition. But he was not man enough to oppose me or to start the polemics with me. But he asked a woman philosopher to attack me in the newspaper when my review was about. <laughs> so I just left. <laughs> Maybe I'll just ask you, I just have a question specifically for, for Emma. Uh, when, when you're presented with, you obviously go to, to performances and, and, and your, your uh, magazine covers uh, across work and, and companies across Canada, how in the editorial room when, I guess it's, it's probably easier when there is a, a good performance, when there's a, something really strong and it's, it's almost maybe easier to engage in, in a critical discourse about that. How, how do you handle something where, in a situation like Brane's, where perhaps there's, you need to, to delve into something uh, more negatively critical uh, and, and how, how have you dealt with that in the editorial room at Dance Current? <laughs> I was going to continue from what uh, Bronnie was talking about, but I'll, I'll get around to that. Um, yeah, I think it, as a critic, you can't be scared of receiving criticism yourself because by critiquing something or commenting on something or describing something, 
you also open yourself up to a reaction. And it's just part of the job. And I think part of my job as editor has been to find the right people to comment on specific works, particularly because we cover all kinds of dance. So finding somebody, for example, that has expertise in no performance, uh, you know, style of, of like Japanese opera, um, is appropriate in certain times, or finding somebody that knows about Ukrainian dance to review a show is appropriate at other times. And um, that way I'm sort of protecting that critic from, uh, f protecting the critic, protecting ourselves, protecting the performer from having, from criticizing something through a really Euro-Western lens. So that's become really important to us and it's from listening to my community and their concerns uh, that I've kind of started to take that approach and, and I think it's, it's something that's been really important mm -hmm. uh, to me and that way our review is not just this was bad because it doesn't look like what I'm used to, but this was, didn't work for me because, you know, and there's a larger context around that conversation. Um, yeah, I, I, I've written somewhat negative reviews about things and it's usually because I take some sort of uh, offense to something, <laughs> like the broader social context around something isn't working for me. That's when personally I, I feel like I can take the, the negative mm -hmm. critique back if it does come back at me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I just have a follow up question. What are, uh, on the flip side, what are the, 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 the benefits that you, I, I guess why, why, why is it important to have a, a publication like Dance Current, or or what, why should we be writing about art? So those are the consequences. But what are the the very like the deep benefits of this? Why why do we do this thing? Emma. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh gosh, there's I mean there's so many different reasons, and one of the reasons I think is because Canada is huge, and we don't get to see all the amazing work that happens in any discipline. And so having a national magazine in that um, that does go out to anyone that wants to read about it is one of the ways that we can showcase the variety of artists. It is a question. Oh, is it question time? <laughs> um, but there's also so many other reasons, and I think one is for artists to learn to talk about their own work is very, very important and crucial and will help them develop their own work mm -hmm. and also engage with their community and share ideas to be very general about it. Yeah. 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 Well, I take uh, writing criticism very personally and I can say I do it for my own peace of mind. When I think and feel of, that I have something to say, I say it or write it down and publish it. And uh, I don't care uh, if somebody agrees or doesn't agree. If somebody disagrees with argument, then we can enter into polemics. But in general, I follow what uh, the great poet Dante Alighieri used to say. Non ti curar di lor, ma guarda e passa. Don't take care about what they say. Just look in front of you and walk. I, I think one of the things about criticism, I'm, I, I sort of, I would say I, I have a reputation of being a little bit curmudgeon -y. Um So when, when it comes to, to, to thinking about and talking about music, so I, I, I am consistent in that. And, and I think that when you're talking about reviews, if you are known as a, as a critic who is, 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 is a, not a harsh critic necessarily, but a, you know, like a critic, uh, as opposed to a booster, then you know if you're consistently do, do, doing that, then then you build a reputation as that, and 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 those reviews mean a lot more yeah. when you get a good review from from a critical uh, publication of some sort. It really does mean something, as opposed to you know like the boosterism, which is which has a place. Um, I just want to say one of the things that that for, for we sort of touched touched upon it. Um, 
I guess I would say that I try to set up artists in situations where they are going to be able to self-reflect and put themselves with peers and idols, I guess, in some ways, and to be able to compare themselves in a relative, in combination of low, high pressure situations. And it's particularly, it has to do with concerts and promoting shows. And I guess it would work with exhibits and in and, 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 and that you take someone who has aspirations and they succeed in a limited community uh, and then they go and they play a show on a stage with a, an artist that really does it for a living. And that really is the best way for artists to see where they need to go rather than me telling them that they need to rehearse. It's more important that they, that they, they, they see the benefits of rehearsing. It's like, wow, we just got our asses kicked and blown off the stage. And hopefully the best artists will, will take inspiration from that. I mean, and that's part of the process is, is, is the artists who can take the criticism, who can take the input, can internalize and improve and don't take it too personally and fly off in a huff and go into a corner. And you know, my whole process is to find the people that are committed to the art and the process. Maybe just to add a quotation I like very much and I use it sometimes when I'm asked to open an exhibition. Uh, you know, uh, and it is in the relation to art critic uh, who operates in the field of visual arts. Um, the great French poet, Paul Éluard, said once, Il faut toujours s'excuser de parler peinture. One has always to excuse himself when he speaks about painting. But all the time we speak and write about visual production, visual arts. Oh, that's, that's wonderful, thank you. Uh, so I, I'd like to turn now to, to our situation, specifically here in New Brunswick. And I know, I know for, for Emma and Bronna, your, your experience here in our province is, is limited, but I'm hoping that we can frame it in a way that you can give us some insight and then we can, we can learn from this. So, so I think we're all on the same page that we recognize that critical discourse is something that we need, we need to engage in, it's important, you've covered that. Th the problem is here in New Brunswick that is that we have very few critics. Sometimes in some disciplines we have n no one who can write in an authoritative way or in a critical way about, about our work. How, what, 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 what do we have to do or what, what framework is needed or what can arts organizations or artists do to, in a small province, in a place where there are limited resources, how can we begin to build a system in which there can be critical discourse? Uh, Emma, do you have do you have any thoughts? Again, I know you're coming from from Toronto, where I mean it's it's a larger center, of course. But yeah, what how, what can we do to perhaps even like how do we reach out to a, to a broader audience or yeah, just thoughts thoughts on that. I'm not exactly sure, but I'll. I'll <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, from my perspective, when I get an idea for a story. It's not often pitched to me. So I recently published a piece on a Halifax artist um, named Lilio Nacarmine, and I was really at a loss to find a writer that wanted to take up writing about her, partly because it's a small community and there are conflicts of interest, and there I didn't know of that many writers there. And I, I ended up reaching out to a music writer uh, to write the piece, which and it it turned out great, but it would, you know, it, w it wasn't my first choice for the story. And I think that, from my experience, and I don't think this has to be the case, but w in cities and communities where there, there's a critical discourse built into some sort of training program, um, there's more of an opportunity for people to recognize that they have that voice and they have things to say about their own practice. And um, I know different magazines do different things, but the Dance Current, we often, most of our writers have our dancers also, or were dancers. And um, not all, but most. And it's people that have shown interest 
and we take extra time with those people when they may not be professional writers to edit their work and care in the community and all of those things. And um, we don't have a lot of money to do it, but it's just kind of a passion project. So that's my one suggestion. Yeah, I think that's a really good idea about bringing in educational, using the educational system that we have here in place to to, to begin training training little writers to, to go out into the Maritimes and, and write. Uh, Peter, what's, what's your perspective from, from St. John and from New Brunswick? Like what, in an ideal world, what, what kind of critical ecosystem would you like to see here? And do you have any thoughts on how we can get there? Well, I, I think uh, there, there's no lack of talent here in any of the d disciplines. Uh, and I think we do actually compare very well to all sorts of sorts of markets and constituencies. I, I, I do think it's great having, um, it's a lot easier for us to bring people down here than it is for us to go somewhere else. So, and, and I, I think it's, it, we, so the, these processes where we bring uh, experts and professionals down here to, to show what we're doing, they have a couple of benefits in that they're, people who come down tend to be a little more focused, they don't have to worry about picking someone up from the soccer game. They're here to experience art or music or whatever and to apply their expertise so they appreciate that. And then when you combine that with, um, generally speaking, um, a really high quality of presentation, it can make a, you can make a, you can really make a, an impression. Uh, and I think that, you know, in the music community, we try very hard to get people from the industry to come down here. Um, you know, a band I work with, we just drove to Toronto and back in three days, did three shows to play for one person at the Bovine Sex Club at 11 o'clock on, on, on Halloween night. And other than the fact that it was utter hell, um, the person showed up and, and something happened from that, from that process. Uh, it would have been a lot easier if we had been able to bring this person down and we have brought people down um, and bringing people down, at least in the music, and I would say in galleries, and, and it's really great when you can showcase what you do from home. Uh, sense of pride, comfort level. Um, you know, for me to showcase a band, I would rather bring somebody in and that allows me to control the space that the band or the art is presented in so that it's a very high comfort level for the artist so that they're in their most natural environment and so that the critic gets to see them, uh, you know, basically in, you know, at the home field advantage, as opposed to going to the Bovine Sex Club at 11 o'clock on a Saturday night, which, trust me, was not a home field advantage. Um, but anyway, so, so like bringing people in, uh, and, and, and one of the things, and, and people in, critics and people in the business, they talk. They talk amongst themselves all the time, and it doesn't take very many people coming down seeing the quality of the work in, in any variety of genres and, and mediums, they talk and they let people know that there's something happening down here and it gets easier to get people down here. And once you get people down here, then it also gets easier to get artists out of here because you've made some connections outside of your home market. Well, I think uh, there can be certain parallels about your community and Slovenian community in general. We are a small country, small nation, and we have more or less the same problems. How to be recognized, uh, one of the most usual mistakes, people who don't know exactly where Slovenia is, they mix Slovenia with Slovakia. And uh, even people who, who come to the country as tourists, they think they are in Slovakia. You know, <laughs> that's already one of the problems of the national identity and so. And in the arts, well, what counts, especially today, today art is globalized. And uh, no matter when one, uh, where one lives, 
you live in a small country, but uh, via internet and uh, all these uh, social networks and so, and uh, all the information you can get immediately. You can have uh, all the art magazines and all the newspapers and weeklies on, on the internet, so you are informed directly and immediately about what is going on. So what is important, and today also it is very easy to travel, and the prices of flights uh, are quite low, they're cheap, uh, uh, through websites like booking.com, you can get very strong, uh, big reductions in hotel prices. So, so wherever there's a big art event somewhere uh, within your reach, I mean, and that within your reach that is uh, a few thousand kilometers away, uh, not necessarily across the ocean, but uh, you can go here to the United States and other countries, and which are big countries. Uh, while in Europe you can go to any European capital if there is a biennial or a major show uh, curated by famous cur curators and so on, or showing the world's best known artists. So that's one uh, aspect. The other aspect is you have to communicate. Every artist should have a book uh, with his words, I mean, uh, presentation, uh, reproductions, and uh, essential data, or a website. So, but it's not uh, enough to have it and become back to you, but you have to look what is going on and who might be either a collector or an art dealer might be interested in the work you do in the sense that uh, on his or her website, there are works similar to your research. So, so communicate, communicate, communicate. And uh, what is important is direct communication. For example, also and uh, to get in touch with the physical object as it is. You know, it's not, many times I'm asked by artists to write about the work either for catalogs or for other reasons, and they send me images by email. I said, okay, that's the basic information. If I'm interested or not at all interested in what they do, but if they want me to write about, I have to come to their studio and see physically the presence of the object and the aura of, of the, the artwork. That's important. Thanks. Um, yeah, so a uh, couple questions and observations. So the one thing that we're definitely hearing consistently is that artists need to circulate their work and they need to be creative about how they do that. So just to quickly respond to Peter's uh, depiction of the print media, that, that's very accurate. But I do think that in New Brunswick, um, the arts community, you know, we really need each other and we really need to do things like start developing more peer critique networks, which is part of the point of this week weekend, is that, you know, meet meet people you don't know, maybe you see people that you, you used to know, but uh, it would be a great idea for most of us to do things like invite people to our studios or share some of our writing, and instead of just waiting for someone from some big city to notice us, to just start at least circulating it in the province and then hopefully build those networks and get better at what we're doing. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, Emma's gonna be teaching a workshop tomorrow on how to pitch. So uh, maybe don't wait until you're 100% confident, but take some risks and, and, and pitch things outward and ask for studio visits. And, I, you know, I've done things like ask for virtual studio visits. So I might not be able to fly someone in to speak with me, but we can at least kind of have a conversation about my work. Um, so yeah, and, and you know, there are some up and coming online publications, like Grid City Magazine is doing a reasonable job, and uh, the East is, is something that exists and can do a good job sometimes. But it, again, we need critique of our critique as well so that that gets better and, and to not be shy about that and you know, to be willing to make ourselves vulnerable, <laughs> I guess, is a lot of it. And what, something that all of you um, have expressed that is something that you're comfortable doing, but it's probably something that comes with practice. So. Yeah, so just kind of start, I think, is a big part of it. I don't have a question. Okay. <laughs> but I'd just like to add 
to that and, and this whole notion of um, vulnerability and, and I guess the, the courage to voice critique um, and to engage in critical discourse. And I think part of what we're seeing in terms of the decline of, of reviews and critiques in, in mainstream media is um, it is partly this small community thing where you d you, know, you don't want to say anything that might hurt someone's feeling feelings. But there's a, there's a really important element to um, the notion of criticism that I think maybe needs to be revisited and reclarified, and that is that it is, to my mind, a combination of a very personal emotional response qualified by knowledge and education and experience so that it's not it's not a, a personal attack it is a dialogue I mean in in print it's a very one-way dialogue but I think with the advent of social media and online communication that more of that discourse can be had and I think that if if in fact as a community you know within New Brunswick within our individual, um, cities and, and outlying areas, if we can just um, maybe be less shy and take the brave step of, of actually having conversations about why it is, I, th I think, why I have an, un, you know, an unenthusiastic response to this work or why I'm over the moon about this work and what is it that is, that is affecting me or not affecting me and let's talk about why that's happening. I think that would just be really advantageous. And you know, some of the Pecha Kucha things that have been happening through ArtsLink, I think, are really good um, avenues for opening up that dialogue. That's fantastic advice. We'll take one more question before we wrap up for the night. Any other questions? No, any, oh, yes, Jared. Uh, Here, I better give you the mic, we're recording oh, things. Okay, okay. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, I just have a, a quick question, just uh, Mr. Kovic, when you were talking about um, um, about work that became kind of invisible in, in uh, Slovenia, in, in the West, and like uh, kind of you know socialist realist art was kind of invisible in the West because it was seen as like being censored. Uh, but conversely, you know Rauschenberg, you mentioned, you know was uh, elevated at, at, in Venice because of some dubious processes. So, um, so obviously, art is to some degree or another always contingent on some kind of economic or political model, uh, which kind of determines uh, the success of that art or even the form of that art. Um, so, I'm wondering, all of your opinions on: uh, is it possible to separate the art from that, you know, invariably kind of corrupt context in which it emerges? Uh, so, can we just talk about? The formalism, or do we have to talk about all of it, or like how do we, how do you negotiate that? Uh, well, it's a very big question, yes, but uh, uh, no, sometimes big questions uh, demand uh, simple answers. Uh, on one side, it is true what you said and what I mentioned when I was speaking about the system. And I said, and I repeat again, the history of modern art was written by art dealers, not by art critics and art uh, uh, historians. And it is the same thing going on today. So if uh, somebody exhibits with Larry Gagosian or Aquavella or any other major gallery and has major collectors. All the art magazines write about him. But you are right. That does not mean that uh, uh, what is offered by these great dealers and famous names is also great art. This can be produced artificially, and I think one of the most exposed products in this sense is, for example, Jean-Michel Basquiat. His work has nothing to do with art, but he's famous, and his paintings are being sold for millions of dollars just because he was Andy Warhol's lover. That's the paradox of the modern world. 
And where I agree with you is a lot of good art is being produced by artists who are not represented with by big dealers and who are not in big collections, either private or public. So that is also one of the reasons why I like to go to the studios to see what the artists are doing. And no matter how popular or famous they are, we can still produce great art. And that's it. And what counts is the personal involvement of the artist, is his uh, ability, his craft, his métier, and his ideas. And if you can look at the work of, the work of art, you can discover the real value of a single work of art or of, or of, a, or of a specific particu particular artist. Did you have final thoughts, Peter? Uh, uh, sort of, uh, s s sort of vaguely. The, the question. I mean, I I'm not a. I don't create art. I, I I love working with it, and I and I love the your term aura. But you know, like like trying to find those auras, those those special those special creations. Um, I guess I really do believe that that art and commerce are are part are two sides of the same coin. Um, some of what you've spoken of made me realize that you know that often the nature the art is kind of speculative um, as a manager i'm speculating that i see somebody who's a young artist and i'm speculating that there may be an artist that there may be an audience out there for them uh, working in music and i guess in some some fields uh, you tend to be great i'm not really looking for a single dealer uh, you're looking to find something that connects to more people than other stuff so so I, I guess I mean I I see it as the same thing. I see it as part of the same pro. The, the, I, I see art and commerce as really very important two sides, and one without the other is I don't know, just doesn't seem to work for me at least. That was a terrible answer. Sorry. Maybe we're approaching the yeah. the end. Huh? Maybe to conclude, I'll just uh, tell you an anecdote. When I was a student, I had a girlfriend whose father was a painter. And one evening we got a bit drunk and we started a dispute. And we had more drinks. And she said to me, well, why you critics? You cannot paint. How can you criticize the work of the painters? And I said, sorry, my dear. I have never pounded an egg, but I can make omelets better than all the hands in this world. That's wonderful. Thank you. Oh yes, Emma, did you have a did you have a final comment? I, uh, I, I, yeah. I think that for me, I see. So my answer is, I can never detach dance from from politics because, uh, for me, dance training systems and bodies are always inherently political, for a different reason, for different reasons, and so, um, to me. I always see that when I watch dance, even if I can look at the form and sort of detach myself in that way a little bit more objectively, I, I can never completely do that because I think um, the way that we learn, and I'm sure this is true of other forms as well, but I'm just speaking from experience, the way that we learn and uh, embody work is always really political. <laughs>